Hey guys, it's Jessica and where do I go? Ryan! I'm supposed to be doing a video. You guys see that, right? Today we're going to tell you the story of La Llorona. Now, there have been movies made about this, but we're going to give you our version. La Llorona is a Latin American legend with many variations throughout the southwestern United States, Mexico, Central, and South America. La Llorona is a doomed spirit, trapped between two realms, that of the living and that of the dead, sealed in anguish by her jealousy, vanity, and rage. Her story is one of wisdom and warning about the peril of indulging these feelings. The earliest known account of La Llorona dates back to the 16th century. She has tormented the living for over 400 years and haunts the imaginations of children and adults alike. There are many stories told by people who say they've encountered this sad and hateful spirit, which is said to wander through forests near the banks of rivers and lakes. Her appetite for vengeance is eternally unsatisfied, and those unfortunate enough to cross paths with La Llorona find themselves devoured by her bottomless hunger, or worse. This is the story of La Llorona. What follows is a mix of several legends, with some creative license of our own mixed in. Centuries ago, an infant child born to a peasant family was christened with the name Maria. Even as an infant, Maria's unparalleled beauty inspired the love and affection of all who laid eyes on her. As a child, residents and visitors of her humble village showered her with gifts, praise, and attention, which Maria quietly relished. As a teenager, Maria would spend countless evening hours standing in front of her mirror by candlelight, admiring her own beauty, recalling the fawning adoration of the people in the village. You are so beautiful, Maria, she would whisper to herself. None compared to you. From south to north, east to west, I'll never find another like you. As she emerged into adulthood, young men both rich and poor began to congregate in front of Maria's home each evening, waiting for Maria to appear. Maria would don a spectacular white gown, a gift from the village tailor, which was woven from a thread much finer than an ordinary peasant family could possibly afford. Reveling in the attention of the nightly crowds, Maria would throw open the shutters of her loft, basking in the gasps and cheers of the thrilled and hopeful suitors below. To the disappointment and heartbreak of a thousand young men, Maria eventually took a husband, a wealthy man in his middle age who lavished her with love and adoration each and every day of their marriage, at least at first. On their wedding night, he carved their initials in the psalmwood tree in front of their marital home, together with the phrase, But for me... None shall have you. Now wedded to a doting husband, Maria's attention turned away from the adoring crowds, which thinned each night until none appeared beneath her window at all. Maria's husband was a traveling businessman whose train would frequently keep him away from home for days, sometimes weeks at a time. Maria, unaccustomed to being left alone, would spend the days in her marital home, gazing at her own reflection, drowning in a river of nostalgia for the field of adoring eyes beneath her bedroom window. Upon his return home from each successful venture, Maria's husband would shower her with fine and exotic gifts, perfumes, silken gowns, gems, and golden jewelry. At first, this sated Maria's hunger for affection, but over time this routine felt more and more hollow, and Maria became more and more distant and withdrawn inside herself. Eventually, Maria became pregnant with twins, and this news filled Maria with a joy she'd nearly forgotten. At last, Maria thought to herself, my husband will remain home with me, and I will have his full attention always. For Maria, her pregnancy was a salvation an escape from the tortured loneliness which had come to define her marriage. Her relief would be short-lived. Maria bore her husband two twin boys. 
Perceiving them as her husband's anchor, Maria fiercely protected her two children, refusing to allow even friends and family to visit the infant boys. The baby carriage gifted to the family by a local shopkeep went unused, as Maria kept her children inside the home, behind a locked door, under her watchful eye. Over the ensuing weeks and months, protecting her boys became an obsession. Maria would sit at their side for days, then weeks at a time, not eating, not sleeping, until her once heavenly eyes had become dark and sunken, her body withered and frail. Her now tattered white gown had turned beige with filth. And it was all for nothing. Maria's husband did not cease his travels. Again and again he would travel to far away places for days and weeks at a time. After one such trip, Maria's husband returned to find his wife had deteriorated into a ghastly form, her bones protruding from her papery and discolored skin, his, her jaw hanging loose between her vacant stare. His love for her had turned to horror, and he pleaded with her to stop this obsession. When I return home from my next business venture, he said, I want to find you fed and well rested. My sister can look after the boys. Promise me. Maria knew it was a promise she couldn't keep, but she promised him anyway. Again and again she promised him, and again and again she broke that promise. Night after night, Maria loomed over her two children, whispering with a deepening rasp. From south to north, east to west, I will never find another like you. This went on for two years. With each passing day, Maria's sadness became more and more poisoned, turning from despondent isolation into a simmering anger. A pressure built up inside her as she welled up with resentment. Upon her husband's return, her greeting turned from delight to indifference. They rarely spoke. Before long, Maria's husband's time away was no longer just for business, but also to pursue a lifestyle of womanizing and alcohol abuse in the neighboring city. Maria's husband had broken faith with his wife. He had broken his vow to remain at her side, and he would soon shatter what was left of her human heart. After another intoxicated week of indulgence in the city, Maria's husband arrived at their doorstep at dusk, not with a loving smile and a cart full of gifts, but in a drunken stupor and with another woman on his arm. I've had enough of this. I want my children, you miserable wretch. You are unfit to care for them. Give them to me, now! Maria's face contorted from despair into rage, and her rage boiled over with such a ferocity that her shriek sent a burst of startled birds from the sawwood tree bearing her initials. She turned into the house, racing for the two boys' cribs, dragging the unused baby carriage behind her. The walls shed their decorations as the carriage tumbled and clattered in the wake of Maria's boiling anger. Come back here! bellowed Maria's husband, stumbling over fallen furniture in pursuit of his wife. I want my children! I want my boys! The door at the rear of the home flew open with a crash, thrown by the weight of the carriage that was now holding the two twins for the first time. As quickly as the calamity started, a desperate quiet filled the evening air as Maria and her two children disappeared into the forest. Her bony knuckles white from her icy grip on the carriage handle, Maria glided over roots and fallen branches, seeming to charge forward without moving her feet. Her face was blank and expressionless, save her eyes red with fire. Guided by her unwavering forward gaze, together she and her sons wove between the trees, over the hill, and deep into the valley below. Overlooking the Santa Fe River, at the base of the valley, at the top of a steep slope leading down to its banks, there stood two mighty copperwood trees, reaching twice the height of the canopy above. These two copperwoods blotted out the moon, casting an indigo shadow over the river below. There, between those trees, Maria appeared with her two sons. Inside the carriage, the two boys cried and cried, and in the forest there was no other sound. Every bird, cricket, and frog had fallen silent, and no other creature dared move a muscle. There, at the top of the slope, it was as though the flow of time had crystallized into an eternity. Maria's face was locked into a ghoulish grin. That moment, it seemed, stretched on forever. A thin, wiry whisper bled from between Maria's dried and cracked lips. But for me, none shall have you. 
Maria released her grip in an instant. The carriage rolled forward, gaining momentum faster and faster, ultimately tumbling end over end, plunging into the inky waters below. Maria's grin held fast, her blazing eyes following the inverted carriage as it was carried by the river below. Finally, its wheels disappeared below the inky water, taking Maria's two sons with them. Her elbows still bent, her hands still hovering over a carriage handle long since released, Maria stood there, motionless, like a statue between the two copperwood trees, at the mouth of a forest rendered mute by this unspeakably evil act. She would remain there, unmoving, for the entire night. When the first glimmer of light touched Maria's skin at dawn, she abruptly collapsed where she stood. Tears flowed from her eyes, forming a stream that would become an estuary to the river below and her wails of inconsolable grief echoed between the trees. Where? Where are my boys? Maria sobbed. Where are they? Who has taken my boys? Help! Somebody please help me! Her calls went unanswered. Eventually, Maria picked herself up off the ground before scrambling down the slope to the riverbank. What? She cried. Where are you? My precious children! Who? Maria's pleas followed her as she wandered downstream at the river's edge. She searched and searched for her twins, growing weaker and weaker with each passing night. But her unending pleas were swallowed up by the empty forest. Nine days later, and nearly 200 miles away, a brother and sister duo were meandering through the forest at dawn, foraging for risotti flour. <laughs> what do you think Mama will make with these flowers today? asked the brother. I hope she makes tortilla con salsa, replied the sister. Or maybe she'll boil them and the juice with a lemon. That's my favorite. Okay, but I, I want the stems, said the brother. Cogoyo is my favorite. The two siblings bantered back and forth like this until they emerged from the forest at the river's edge. There, in the backwater, they discovered Maria's body floating face down. Oh, Dios mio! They cried, dropping their baskets of flowers to the rounded stones below. What has happened to this poor woman? We should get Mama and Papa! cried the sister. Quick! We don't want what happened to her have to happen to us! The pair turned to run home, but were halted in their tracks by the sudden appearance of a ghostly apparition. In the shape of a woman, draped with a radiant white gown, there appeared the broken face of a scorned wife and a grief-stricken mother. A crippling fear traveled up the siblings' spines, and the two children found themselves unable to move, their eyes locked on the glowing red sockets of the translucent creature in front of them. Seemingly from all directions, a voice rose up from the wilderness. It was a woman's voice, desperate and withering, emanating in a terrifying chorus from between every tree. From south to north, east to west, I will find my boys! La, uh, la Llorona! The children cried, La Llorona! The two siblings were never seen again. To this day, sightings of La Llorona are still reported. Though the legends vary, the apparition is said to act without hesitation or mercy. The tales of her cruelty depend on the version of the legend you hear. Some say that she kills indiscriminately, taking men, women, and children, whoever is foolish enough to get close to her. Others say she is very barbaric and only kills children, dragging them screaming to a watery grave. When Patricio Lugan was a boy, he and his family saw her on a creek in New Mexico. As the family was sitting outside talking, they saw a tall, thin woman walking along the creek. She seemed to float over the water. Then she started up the hill and vanished. However, just moments later, she reappeared much closer to them, only to disappear again. The family looked for footprints and, finding none, had no doubt that the woman they had seen was La Llorona. She has been seen along many rivers across the entire southwestern United States, and the legend has become part of culture everywhere. Part of the legend is that those who do not treat their families well will see her, and she will teach them a lesson. La Llorona has been heard at night, wailing next to rivers by many, and her wanderings have grown wider. Her movements have been traced throughout the southwest as far north as Montana, on the banks of the Yellowstone River. The La Llorona, the weeping woman, will always be with them, 
following the many rivers looking for her children, and for this reason many avoid the waters at night. The legend continues to be passed down from generation to generation. That's going to do it, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us for the Halloween special. Uh, We had a lot of fun making it. It was a bit of a production. It was a break from the normal routine, so that was fun. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, especially the silly parts. Yeah. (laughs) Right on. All right. So, uh, coming up next, we have a special video with a birthday girl. She Mm -hmm. just had her birthday recently here. We took her over to Sunset Park. And, uh, you know, on the rides, the roller coaster, Ferris wheel, that kind of stuff. We've got the whole thing on video for you. So you can see the brand new, freshly opened Sunset Park here in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you like the content, hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell for notifications to never miss an upload. Mm -hmm. Uh, It helps us out a lot. If you hit that like button as well, share it with your friends. Uh, Head on down below. What did you think of the production? Do you want to see more videos like this? Let us know. Leave your comments. All right. All right. So, that'll do it? Yeah, that'll do it. All right. We'll see you soon. All right. Happy Halloween. Bye. Bye.